life and reduce maintenance costs of new structures. I'm Sayanti Mukhopadhyay and I'm a second year master's student in construction engineering. Due to the United States aging infrastructure, it's very important to increase the design life and reduce maintenance costs of new structures. And in order to do this, a durable material must be used, as well as a higher strength material. Um, so you might ask why to use ultra high performance concrete, also known as UHPC. And first of all, that's due to the durability. As shown in this figure here, um, chlorine, chloride ion penetration is much lower in ultra high performance concrete compared to high performance concrete as well as normal concrete. But the more interesting thing to look at is that it actually has a tensile capacity, which is 1.7 KSI, whereas for normal concrete, usually you assume zero capacity. And this capacity comes from the steel fibers put into the mix design. Um, in phase one, shown in this picture, the cross section of the UHPC pile was designed. And if, um, if you look at the outer perimeter dimensions are 10 inch by 10 inch, and this was done because it is put, uh, it was used to replace a steel H pile. Um, and this allows for the same driving equipment to be used. Um, some of the benefits that go along with this cross-sectional area are that it has a less cross-sectional area than normal concrete pile. And this um, increases the drivability along with the tensile um, strength. And then if you look at it compared to the steel H pile, it has a greater cross-sectional area, so you have a higher end-bearing component. We'll have, um, we'll have field testing. We'll do another static and uh, lateral load test. And then we will install the UHPC pile into a bridge in Sac County, Iowa, and monitor it for um, a year to two years. And this will be done shortly in the fall. Hi, my name is Joel Sikma. I'm going to present my poster. It's titled, Review of United States um, Cement Manufacturing Facilities, Mercury Regulations, Inputs, Atmosphere Commissions, and Control Strategies. This project was worked on by uh, myself and my co-major advisors, James Allman and Seiki Long in the Environmental Division of our department. To set the context for you a little bit, cement manufacturing facilities uh, process about one 100 million metric tons of cement annually every year in the United States. There's about 100 different manufacturing facilities, and these facilities are all impacted by new stringent mercury emissions regulations. Uh, they're going to be currently unregulated, but in the near future, they're going to have regulations of 55 pounds of clinker of mercury per million metric tons clinker. Um, clinker is essentially the product that's uh, ground down into cement. And then for new facilities, new construction, it's the regulation is even more stringent at 21 pounds mercury per million metric tons clinker. Um, so one thing that we thought that might be of use to the industry, well, and it, and it certainly will be, is some sort of simplification. Uh, the idea is that perhaps um, we can make generalizations about the plants. The most obvious one and after reviewing the data was to uh, trying to develop some sort of correlation between the largest input of mercury limestone, which is also the largest feedstock input to the facility, and mercury emissions. Hi, I'm Sayanti Mukhopadha and I'm a second year master's student in construction engineering. My major professors are Dr. Shane and Dr. Strong, and my research topic is identification and assessment of the risks involved in operations and maintenance activities of the highways. My major motto of this project is to identify the different factors that are involved in the mobile operations that are mainly painting, you know, the guardrail repairing, the patching of the roads, these kinds of activities on the highways. And our aim is to identify the factors or the hazards and their corresponding severity and the frequencies to develop an integrated risk management model, which would be helpful for the DOT people to plan for their mobile workshops. Hello everyone, I'm Nishant Garg and I'm going to talk about my poster which is 
title as Increasing Use of Flash in Concrete Through Nanometer Modification, Multi-Skin Characterization, and Improved Processing. Now, if I start with what is flash? Flash is basically the waste ash that goes up when you burn coal, and we burn coal for our energy demands. And due to that, we are producing more than 120 millions of flash every year in the United States. So, but that flash can be actually used in concrete to replace cement by weight, but the conventional percentages that can be replaced are only 15 to 20 percent. But by using nanotechnology, what I'm trying to do is, is that increase that conventional percentage up to 40 to 50 percent. Hi, my name is Jing Man. My major professor is Dr. Song Shi Wu, and the project we're working on is green nutrient removal technology. In the wastewater, um, the major pollutant we want to remove are COD and nutrient. In our study, we're trying to remove nutrient, specifically ammonia, in a very energy efficient way. So for the traditional uh, nutrient removal process, ammonia has to go through nitrification and denitrification, which are very um, energy intensive because they require intensive aer aeration. Um, for the animal's process, 50% of ammonia will go through partial nitrification, they become nitrite. Animax bacteria will convert nitrite and ammonia to nitrogen gas one step without need of any, any aeration. Um, theoretically, the energy reduction can be 6 to 0.5, which is very significant because today every, uh, we are moving towards any, uh, sustainable development. This is Gada, I'm a construction engineering PhD student in the uh, civil department. Uh, my PhD is mainly on the effect of culture, risk and trust on the choice of dispute resolution methods in international construction contracts. And the uh, research is under the supervision of Dr. Jennifer Shane. Um, what I'm mainly looking at is dispute resolution methods in international contracts. And why am I looking at that? It's mainly because in international construction contracts, dispute resolution methods, and in general in most construction contracts, dispute resolution methods are chosen just without really uh, much reasoning. In the, um, what I mean by reasoning here is that um, we don't look at the project conditions because um, it seems like the project conditions affect really the choice of dispute resolution methods. Like, for example, if you're talking about the culture of the contracting parties, or the trust level between the contracting parties, or the risk of the project, the level of risk, is it a high-risk project or is it a low-risk project? So actually, depending on those um, uh, the, uh, project conditions, I think, like, and through the studies will be pro proven, hopefully, that uh, there should be dispute, certain dispute resolution methods um, chosen. There are different dispute resolution methods that we can see, like, they go so far from being very formal and being um, very not friendly to being like informal and not expensive. So there are different characteristics of those. Like if you see litigation, litigation is really the most expensive, um, mostly, and um, it's the longest and it involves lawyers, it's a long process. Versus, for example, something like mediation, which just involves a mediator that comes in and sit there, sits there between um, two parties and try to solve the dispute. Hello, my name is Amy Cervantes, and I'm a master's student working with Dr. Michelle Sapir. I study resuspension with E. coli in a flume downstairs in Town 55. I basically measure at two different points what the resuspension of the E. coli is and how much is attached to the sediments. The sediments move um, in a fluid manner, and sometimes there's deposition and resuspension. However, this isn't really included in the models, which is why I'm doing my research project. Hi, my name is Alida Azmi, and I am a third year PhD student here in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. And my major professor is Dr. Jennifer Shane. And my um, project title is Dev Development of Effective Construction Project Teams in Design Build Projects. So this is actually a pilot study that I conducted as um, a requirement for my dissertation. And the purpose of this study is trying to find what are the factors that contribute to um, developing the most effective construction project teams. So the, the population for this study is actually um, design-built companies throughout the Midwest. And the sample that was being used is convenient sampling. And the methodology that has been adopted for this study are two uh, types of methodology. The first one is literature review, 
where um, re literature review on team effectiveness um, has been examined and I found out nine different aspects of, um, of factors that contribute to successful um, construction project teams which are company and top management support, audit and monitoring, team leadership, um, team goals and objectives, roles and responsibilities, creativity and innovation, team task processes, team relationship, and also team communication.